It's really delightful to see so many of you here, many faces that I recognize, many people who have been instrumental in helping to establish the Gordon MIT Engineering Leadership Program. Um, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to have Bernie here to talk to uh, all of you. I have a brief introduction, which I really want to go through because I think there are some important points about this talk. Um, and then I'll get off as quickly as I can and, and give Bernie a chance to talk to you. The first thing I want to mention is that this event is not just a talk. It's a testimonial to a great engineer and a generous benefactor who has donated not only his money, but his energy and guidance to enable the MIT School of Engineering to establish and endow the Gordon MIT Engineering Leadership Program. It was established just in July of 2007, and in the 10 years since that time, has grown to be a large and influential program here at MIT. Its job is to supplement MIT's excellent technical education by helping our students develop the professional and leadership skills that will help them to forge impactful and successful careers. It doesn't just happen. It has to be made to happen. So I'm Joel Schindahl, uh, MIT alum. I won't tell you my class, it's way back there. Um, but I lived in East Campus. Um, and uh, I had a 35 year in career in industry before returning to MIT as the Bernard Gordon Professor of the Practice in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. Uh, and I'm now the director of the Gordon MIT Engineering Leadership Program uh, and also of the very closely related UPOP program. And I know we have many UPOP students in the audience as well. If you're in UPOP or the GEL program, or if you've taken it, or if you've applied to take it next year, or if you've just helped to design or develop the program, could you raise your hands? That's great. So I, I want to get a sense of, you know, essentially, part of what has made this program successful is you by going out and taking what we actually help to develop and using it in the classroom, you've helped to demonstrate the importance and the worth of the leadership capabilities. This year, just so you know, we had over 220 students, mostly sophomores, apply for next year's GEL-1 program. That's nearly 25% of the, of the School of Engineering sophomore class. Many of our program graduates have gone on to strong industry careers, and many companies specifically recruit GEL graduates because of their important teamwork and leadership skills. The program is having a great impact. Let me tell you about Bern a bit about Bernie. If you've used or viewed an ultrasound fetal monitor, traveled to security in an airport, had a CAT scan or an MRI, you've used and benefited from products that were developed by Bernie and provided by one of the companies that he started. It's important to tell you that this didn't simply happen by accident or by good luck. I've known Bernie for 15 years now, and I never cease to marvel at and learn from his fierce commitment and drive. Bernie is an engineer's engineer. He realizes in every fiber of his being that engineering goes beyond theory and research. It includes inventing to need and it includes the implementation of that invention in a practical form. Most importantly, Bernie delivers as promised. Engineering is a proud profession. It demands character and integrity. Ask Bernie if he has failed, and he will recoil as if you insulted him. In addition to the skill to know what is possible, Bernie has the force and commitment to make it happen. Bernie's success led to his being president of several companies but he rejects being thought of as a, as a successful businessman. He is a proud and successful engineer in the full spirit of the engineering professionals who built the United States we know, bridges, dams, roads, railroads, electrification, mass production, and more. Bernie's bio is impressive, but I don't think it would capture the force and focus that Bernie exemplifies. Instead, I will get off the stage and let Bernie tell you what it is to go beyond knowing about engineering or doing engineering, but what it is to actually be an engineer. Thank you.
Thank you, Joel. I'll try to live up to your introduction. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm pretty old. <laughs> I've been an engineer now uh, over 70 years. And I came to MIT courtesy of the United States Navy. In fact, I took a lot of lectures in this course, in this room. <clears throat> Actually, I didn't get into MIT. When I was a kid in high school, like many of you, I was the smart kid in school. And everybody at the high school said, this kid should go to MIT. And so I applied to MIT. And I got interviewed, I remember to this moment, by a Professor Gray, who interviewed me and asked me at the end of the interview, what did I do after high school? And I said, I build outhouses. Most of you don't even seem to know what an outhouse is. <laughs> who knows what an outhouse is? Oh, well, OK, good. And I fix radios, I said. And he literally, at that moment, word for word, said to me, I don't think you're the type we want at MIT. And so I didn't get in. And there was a war on, and I was 16, and I joined the Navy at 16. And nine months later, the Navy sent me to MIT. <laughs> Thereby saving my parents a lot of money and I ended up getting a couple of degrees from MIT, partly initially courtesy of the Navy and later part of the GI Bill. Now, most of you, in fact, all of you are too young, probably, to remember the war that took place in the 1940s. On December 7th, as you all know, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor wiped out half the capital ships, eventually captured half of the US Army. And that was in December of 1941. And in April of 1942, we attacked Guadalcanal. And at the end of the year, had 50,000 military airplanes, Tens of thousands of landing craft. An M1 rifle was made every second in my hometown, Springfield, Massachusetts. And 16 million people out of 130 million people were in the military. Now, you couldn't do that today. You could not move into production, get the engineering done, and move into production that fast today and there was not a single electronic computer. In my opinion, in people in those days in industry had much broader <coughs> educations. It's sort of like today if you go to a medical school and you go to work at a place like the Leahy Clinic you are a very narrow specialist. It's very hard to find generalists. So one of the things on my mind related to developing engineering leadership skills is having the ability, the personality, to be able to wrap your arms around a complete, complex project knowing something about this, something about this, something about this, something about this. <laughs> An analogy would be in the Navy, the captain of a ship. He's got to know a little bit about armaments, ordnance. He's got to know a little bit about supplies. He's got to know a little bit about navigation and may have people on board who are better navigators than he are, is, or better ordnance. I should say he or she. I have to do these days. So. There's been some cultural differences over the years. Uh, some of the things I'd, I'd like to talk about, partly by telling some stories, which is my way of communicating, 
is to talk about various characteristics of people who become successful leaders in engineering. Now, let's take a little statistic. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, is very smart. And every year around the greater Boston area, about 200, some people say 300, technical startups occur. How many succeed? Now, people like to talk about the exceptions, the few very successful companies that eventually evolve. And that number is about one a year out of the 200 that start. Some people would argue it's two. Most of the companies that start, technical companies start, fail for two reasons. And I'll get into this a little later. And initially, what I say may aggravate some of you. The primary reason they fail is because of the ego of the people in the company. I see a lady here nodding her head. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the second reason is they don't know what they don't know. Let me give you a simple example of this. I became the director of a company in Beverly, Massachusetts that makes DNA preparation equipment. And they had been in business about four years, had gone through $10 million. And they were about to ship the first product to England. It's not the, not the first product going to England. Their very first product was going to England. And at that first, first meeting, I said, let me ask a dumb question. Have you got the CE mark? The president of the company said, what's that? And they were as far away on that day after going through $10 million as the day they started the company. They were all wrapped up in their technology and just didn't know enough about, or anything, about the regulations and so forth. All right, so over the years, you know, the culture has changed, but there's a lot of fundamental things that don't change. General ethics don't change. The basis of reasonable relationships with subordinates don't change. Character doesn't change. And yet, I see today, over and over and over again, young technical people think they're being demeaned if they got a boss who tells them what to do. Now, when I was in the Navy, I learned an interesting lesson. Because one day, I got commissioned and became an ensign. And it was raining out in the field. And we became commissioned, and then they put a lieutenant in junior grade, that's the next rank up in the Navy, on the stand. And he said, now that you are commissioned officers, I will give you your first order. Crawl in the mud. And one jerk, me. <laughs> yelled, why, sir? And he said, because I'm a lieutenant, junior grade, and you're an ensign. Now, I can tell some tales later about this. I, I had the, the very good fortune to go to work for the guys. That wasn't my first job, but my second job was going to work for Eckerd and Walkley, who built the world's first commercial computer. And they, thinking I was a smart MIT graduate, they gave me the job of designing a circuit which was supposed to couple pulses into what was then called an acoustic memory. Acoustic memory was say a pulse came here, and you wiggled a piezoelectric transducer here, and it propagated down a mercury line and hit another transducer over here, and then you recirculate it around. And so they gave me the job of trying to figure out the optimum coupling 
of the electronic circuitry into the piezoelectric. <clears throat> and I went home and worked and worked and worked and wrote all kinds of equations. Came back in Monday morning and I showed my result to Mockley. And Mockley took my papers and he turned to the last page and he looked at it and he said, if you'll pardon me, bullshit. <laughs> and I said to him, how, how could you say bullshit? I did all this math. And he says, it's very simple. You're getting out more power than you're putting in through this passive network. <laughs> what an insult. <laughs> OK. So enough of that story. Now, I brought along a book that I just got, which I recommend to you. It's called Grit written by Angela Duckworth. And her whole thesis, re repeatedly through the book, is that nothing counts but your determination. And it's a book worth reading, so I'll just put it down and recommend it to you. Now, I was brought up to believe that engineering is a profession, not a hobby but a profession. And a professional person is a person who performs a service for other people. I meet so many young people today who don't care about other people. They care about themselves. They may pretend politically to care about other people, but when it comes right down to it. And so that if they're in a company working. They, don't, they believe that no one has a right to tell them what to do, to direct them, that they reject that. I see that over and over and over again. And again, and of course, that's a form of ego. Now, if you're going to be a success in engineering, you're going to be a supervisor, you're going to have to deal with all kinds of people You're going to have to meet schedules. You're going to have to meet a specification, get something built to a cost, engage in ethical relationships, understand tolerances, reliability, and manufacturing. And nearly all those subjects and topics are areas that most students coming out of college today are not well versed in at all, or even exposed to. I recently, some, I'm gonna try, I know we got a couple of mechanical engineers sitting over here, but they've been through the leadership program. I recently interviewed a graduate of MIT in mechanical engineering, and I asked him, to go to the board and show me, make me a drawing of how a one-inch shaft would fit into a one-inch hole. And initially, he was very insulted by this question. But I insisted. He went to the board, and he drew a one-inch circle, labeled it one inch, and he drew a sheet with a one-inch hole in it. And I said, but you can't put a one-inch rod in a one-inch hole. And he never heard of the word tolerances, apparently. No, there must be a professor of mechanical engineering who says, this must be very unusual. <laughs> but this actually, this actually happened. And, and so well, let me talk a little bit. Uh, I, I met at lunch today a, a lovely young lady who's about to become a Navy officer. And what I'm about to say was well known to her. I was given a little book called Naval Leadership when I was a kid. And in it, it had a phrase that said, if you will learn to be a leader, you will first learn to be a follower. It also had another phrase that said, loyalty downward begets loyalty upward. So there's a sort of a semi-militaristic view, well known to the colonel here, who's 
got a, a spacious military background, that if you're going to be a leader, A, you've got to be an example for the people you're leading. They have to know that you're looking for out for them first. And that the responsibility for the full success of whatever you're doing is up to that person. In a, in a military manner, for example, let's suppose you are the captain of a ship and you're asleep. And the executive officer is up in the control room called the con and he goes aground. Whose fault is it? It's yours, not his. So a lot of people don't accept that. Now, let me tell you a few semi-business oriented technical stories. And hopefully there's something to transfer to you in each of these tales. Many years ago, indeed in 1954, I built the first analog to digital converter. Now that turned out to be a good thing to do and I later got the National Medal of Technology for doing that. In fact, despite building outhouses, I became the first MIT graduate to get the National Medal of Technology. <laughs> and so we built the A to D converter and we were gonna sell the patent to somebody, Beckman Instruments actually, and the chief executive officer decided to have a then company in Massachusetts called Arthur D. Little make a market survey. This is in now 1955. And so they hired Arthur D. Little to make a market survey on the possible use of high-speed A to D converters. And they came back and said, no deal. We won't buy the patent because Arthur D. Little, in those days, money for 50,000 bucks, now a half a million, reported that there might be a need in the world for 10 A to D converters. Now, analog devices probably makes uh, 100,000 of them a day or more <laughs> uh, today. So later, we met somebody who told us that somebody who had a Univac computer needed to get signals into it. And I happen to know a famous lady named Grace Hopper was one of the more famous ladies in the history of computer technology. And I called up Grace and I said, uh, how many Univacs are out there? And she told me 43 and we sent out 43 telegrams. And the next day, Converse San Diego called. And to make a very long story short, they bought in 19, we had two guys in a gas station, me and my associate. They bought in those days money, you can multiply this by at least 10. They bought $10 million worth of A to D converters from us. Because in those days, they'd fire off a missile. The missile would go 10 feet up in the air, fall over on its side and explode. And it would take them a year with IBM punch cards to reduce the data and get it into a computer. And we could do that at the rate of 50,000, in those days at 50,000 such measurements a second. So. Uh, so they said they're going to buy $10 million worth of equipment. And then a week later, we get a call from the purchasing agent of Converse San Diego. And he says to us, uh, what do you got for money? And we gave an honest answer, nothing. <laughs> and he, we said to him, my associate said to him, what do we have to do to get the order? And much to our surprise, he said, you got to show us $100,000. So my friend Joe Davis knew a guy who knew a guy who knew the richest man in Massachusetts, who was, at that time was Robert Stone of Hayden Stone. And they arranged a meeting for us. And we went out to his house in Dover one morning. And we told him how both of us had met on a ship. And we had left our jobs and cleaned out his basement and gotten this order. And he said to us, well, I won't give you $100,000, but I'll lend you $100,000, but I want 51% of the company. 
And we went through again, look, we met on the ship, we left our jobs, we just invented this, we got the order. <laughs> and he said to me something I have never forgotten. And he said to me, Bernard, my boy, <laughs> what you have done is priceless, and therefore you can't put any value on it. And if you want the $100,000, I get 51% of the company. So he got it. <laughs> now, <laughs> and he turned out to be a gentleman. He, uh, he actually made 20 million bucks of loaning us 100,000 bucks. He gave half of that to Harvard. Some of it he gave back to us, and the, re the rest I think he gave, also gave to the museum of uh, the not the museum, the uh, where the fish are <laughs> in, in Boston. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you know, I, I learned something from that, but not what he meant. I, I did learn that if you can invent something, and if you can make it real. And if you can make it economic, and it's not priceless the way he meant, it's very, very valuable. So if you're going to be a successful engineer, uh, you have to take into account, obviously, uh, the economic aspects of it. And I'd, I'd like to tell you a couple. One of the things that Joel mentioned uh, that I'm supposed to be credited for is the, building the first fetal monitor. And sometimes people ask me, what is the thing that I'm most pleased with that I ever did? And I answered a fetal monitor because millions, of, many millions of lives have been saved with the fetal monitor. You take it for granted today, but in 1957, one out of every seven births in the United States was with a baby with a, a cord wrapped around its neck. And there was no means of determining what was going on. But the point I want to make is we designed the first fetal monitor in 1957. And it wasn't until 1967 that the medical industry began to accept that this was a useful thing to do. And although we had invented, we got whipped by Hewlett Packard, who copied our de basic design. Although our first design was with vacuum tubes, and their design was with semiconductors. But we, couldn't, we could not stand up to Hewlett Packard as a sales force. So there's a lesson to be learned from that. Uh, lesson number three, uh, one day, The president of Siemens called me, and he said to me, what do you know about tomography? And I said to him, I never heard of it. Spell it. <laughs> and he told me that Mr. Hounsfield, who later got the Nobel Prize for building the first CAT scanner at EMI, had a monopoly in the world in CAT scanners. He had built the first CAT scanner in 1972, and this was 1974 when the president called me. And they had been trying to build a CAT scanner to compete with EMI. And I went off and took a course at Purdue by a Professor Koch on the mathematics of image reconstruction. And I came back and sat down with a couple of our engineers and we invented the instant imaging wide dynamic range CAT scanner in one week. Hounsfield's machine took 20 minutes to make an image that looked like a fuzzy picture of Lincoln that you back away from. <laughs> Ours looked like a photograph with meticulous high resolution detail. And in a period of nine months, and the reason I'm telling you is because I'd like you to ask yourself, how did we do it? In a period of nine months, we delivered the first Siemens Somatom CAT scanner. My wife actually made up the name Somatom, being Greek, a body slicer. <laughs> Ready for production and never had 
a single engineering change order. Nine months. Now, I learned that from Mr. Eckert. The world's first commercial computer was released to production without ever building one. See, I can quote today, just like I know a Boy Scout is trustworthy, helpful, kind, obedient, cheerful, and all those good things, the UNIVAC will work when all of its components simultaneously drift to the outer limits of their tolerances under the worst possible conditions of humidity change, voltage change, temperature change, aging of components. Like a catechism. I don't meet many engineers who ever got exposed to that catechism. Many engineers, now I'm talking about engineering leadership, I'm not talking about R&D leadership. There's a difference between R&D and engineering. Because to be repeat, with engineering, you got a time constraint, you got a dollar constraint, you got a specification constraint, and you got something else I didn't, you got competitors. And the object is to beat them. And I hear so many people talk about failure is such a wonderful learning experience. To which I reply, not if you are a fighter pilot. <laughs> now, in real engineering, unlike playful R&D labs, there is a price to pay if you fail. The price is to your reputation, the price is to the financial people who put up the money, and so forth. So there is a price for failure. Now, I'm not saying that making a mistake is a failure. We make all kinds of mistakes when we, engin we engineers. Well, if we correct them and get the job done reasonably on time. Uh, for example, if you uh, designed and built a bridge and then the first, uh, first uh, big wind had fell down, you'd say, whoa, what a wonderful learning experience. Too bad so many people got killed. <laughs> so the question is, how do you get it right, nearly right? the first time. And this is maybe the most critical thing I run into all around Route 128. I see people wanting to accomplish something technically. But if you'll pardon the expression, they want to get their rocks off fast. They want to think they're going to have a quick success. And so they rush off and they start doing something. But you know, most of the time they never get there. Whereas if they start with like a sort of a Gaussian transfer function, we used to say to our customers at Analogic, which we had customers all over the world, where we would out-engineer out their engineers, don't visit us in the beginning because you're going to think we're doing nothing. And that's when we're making specifications and we're making lists of what can go wrong. And we're anticipating how we can fail. And we're going to concentrate on those things first so it'll look like we're not accomplishing a great deal. And then suddenly out will come the product. And it'll be pretty nearly right. Now, I didn't make up that idea. I learned that from Eckert who was one of my first bosses and I sort of have revered all this time. So what we see happening is many people, because of their egos, and I keep coming back to that word ego, failing because of their ego and then blaming it on somebody else. I mean, that usually happens. They, they blame it on somebody else. I'll, I'll give you a story. Up, out in... Uh, uh, this is a true story. It's a, it's a problem I got right now. Uh, out in uh, Chelmsford, there's a company run by a guy named Jerry Goldsmith, who is one of the world's experts on high-voltage breakdown. A company that I will not mention was designing a high-voltage power supply for us, and everything they build fails. Within three or 400 hours, the units break down. And I've been on the phone with their management, 
which, who are basically financial people who bought a company, and saying to them, you have not written a specification for Jerry Goldust. And I've spoken to Jerry Goldust and says, look, they have no specification. Anything I ship them passes because there's no specification. We cannot get the people in that company to write a specification. And just last week, I, I said to their boss and, and to their so-called engineering manager, notice I didn't say chief engineer, engineering manager, I said, is the only reason you're not writing a specification because I suggested it? <laughs> and they sort of laughed, and a week went by, and they still hadn't written a specification, and then I spoke to them again, and I said, you know, we've come to the conclusion that the reason you're not writing a specification is you don't know how. And that turns out to be the truth. They don't know how to write a specification, and so they blame Jerry Goldust. <laughs> We have a few minutes. If anyone has questions, please, please. We do have mics set up, I see, in the, uh, in the aisle way. So uh, if you have any questions or even just some topics that you'd like Bernie to address, uh, could you go over to one of the mics and let us know what it is? Jerry, from where you sit, what's the next new thing that we ought to get into? That's a very difficult question, if it's, it's a serious question. Uh, let me first say, I don't see a reason for many of the things we're getting into. Uh, I, I see uh, uh, a decline, you, uh, I'm sure you know, in the manufacturing capability. I, I had the pleasure of having lunch with six students going to the Gordon Engineering Leadership Program, and they're studying aeronautical engineering and mechanical engineering, but today there's really a dearth of people interested in doing things that are competitive activity. I think a lot of people today are, are really using the same phrase, uh, getting their intellectual rocks off doing things that are not necessarily needed by society. Uh, so I, I think we need a return, in part, uh, to educating people to do uh, physical work, uh, engineer, I mean, build physical products. Uh, and that, that would be my answer to your question. I don't have any highfalutin answer to your question. Well, I, th I think it's not unique to um, the engineering profession. I think it's also true in legal profession. Uh, it's true in, in the medical profession. Um, uh, I think people are, have been learning more and more about less and less. They're becoming more narrow in, their, in the breadth of their activity. Uh, in, uh, when I went to school here, I learned a fair amount of physics, a fair amount of mathematics, a fair amount of uh, me me mechanics, electronics, uh, biology. I, I, I became fairly broad, and so that had engendered, I should say, we had engendered in us a feeling that with that background, we could learn almost anything that we had to learn. And therefore, I think in, in my own career, uh, there's a tremendous diversity of technology that got into it. In, in other words, without a certain background, uh, we certainly couldn't have come up, let's say, as an example that I talked about, with a CAT scanner that involves mechanics, electronics, uh, x-rays, uh, high-speed computing, uh, and envision the system. 
at, uh, at the Technion in Israel, where they also have a similar leadership program. They put a great deal of emphasis on the word system engineering, meaning who is the person who can be in touch with the whole and control the whole project. Now, I, I used for a first time a word that I didn't use in the speech, and that is control. Years ago, if I would give a talk at MIT and say that the leader controls what happens, brings a force to bear, they wouldn't like it. But today it's changed, because there's been some realization that leadership is causing people who report to you to do something that they wouldn't otherwise have done. And in order to do that, you've got to have a breath. I came up with a semi-obnoxious phrase, which I handed to Joel. <laughs> and I think maybe at the first sentence he didn't like it, but now he's come to like it. And the phrase goes something like this. I couldn't have done it without them but they wouldn't have done it without me. And I could have done it. This is the obnoxious part. I could have done it with any other group. <laughs> now, po ponder that. See, what, what? <laughs> Ye years, this is not a new phenomenon. Years ago, the, the founder of a digital equipment company an MIT graduate used to say, I have 6,000 engineers. Only six of them can run a project. Most engineers are so afraid to fail that they don't take responsibility. See, the reason you have so much problem out in the companies today, and this is the real reason for starting the engineering leadership program is in the last few decades, most engineers have not wanted to take on the responsibility. Let me make a personal statement because they believe in part that, gee, if they're gonna become a, a leader, a boss, they gotta give up what they love. Well, you don't have to. In the last 45 years, I ran personally every major engineering project, one at a time, always ran an engineering project in meticulous detail, not just nominally. And I found that's a good thing to do because you get to know what's going on and you, you, set, an, you set an example for everybody else. But the, the, the reason you have the phrase today Engineering manager. Now, some of you people won't agree with what I'm about to say. <laughs> what is an engineering manager? An engineering manager is a person who is supposed to manage the engineers who can't manage themselves. When I was a kid out of school, we aspired to be what was then called being the project engineer. You're the boss. You're the, you're, you're the brains of the outfit, and you're the boss. And many engineers in the past decades have either moved away from that on their own, or they've been caused to move away from that by the, the non-technically oriented managements that have taken over lots of companies. Indeed, you may look this up, and. At course 15, there is a thesis written by two ladies getting their doctor's degree in business who wrote a thesis about 20 years ago that says, no new company can succeed until its founders are fired. It's, Look it up. <laughs> it is so. So it's, it's this belief that the technical people are incapable of getting their arms around more than just the technology. And of course, everybody is capable if they make up their mind to.
we're going to uh, near, need to end the formal part of the meeting. Uh, any of you are welcome to come up front if you have other questions. I want to I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, actually. I want to tell you that from my own experience in industry, it is difficult to find people working for you who take responsibility, who take ownership, and what we're working very hard to do is take the people with the excellent technical qualities that MIT develops and also help them develop the force and the passion and the professionalism to be the engineering leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much, Bernie.